so then uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and start and uh, i'm sure that all of you had very um healthy well the ganesh chaturthi and uh, so today we are very very fortunate to have stephen nap who is known as sri nandanananda dasa who is a direct disciple of prabhupada and um, he has been reading lot of books over so many years and after he read bhagavad gita so he found the right kind of book the message and the serenity and uh, the peace of mind one can get by reading it and he traveled widely almost all european countries and us canada and india probably more so than most of the other countries and we were fortunate actually to have met him we although we know him for more than 20 years we were fortunate to invite him to india on behalf of global hindu heritage foundation some of you are aware that we conducted pada yatra to make sure that people are aware of what is happening to the hindu temples how government is controlling how the government is looting and all the other issues dealing with the lands and all that so after we completed the pada yatra in 2007 january we had a very big meeting more than 10 10000 people attended in tirupati so that is the time that we invited sri nandanaanand ji to come and speak on the occasion so 2008 so he gave a very inspiring speech and then he went all over india and then gave his speeches also as i mentioned he, uh, you know he is very much interested in hindu culture he has written more than 40 books just imagine so almost uh, every year he is he is uh, trying to see that uh, one book comes out in addition to that one he has probably written more than 100 articles dealing with the various aspects of uh, sanatan dharma and uh, some of you may remember i am sure some of you probably have seen taj mahal pictures where they showed the indian uh, images on the uh, taj mahal so it is sri nandanaanand ji pictures are the ones i think he took almost about either 29 or 30 pictures which would reveal the hindu images on taj mahal because he is a very good uh, photographer so that's the reason so he, he has a he is a multi talented gentleman so we are very very fortunate that uh, he agreed to spend some time talking about the survival of hinduism what is it that we can do and he feels some of these issues can be countered by defending the vedic knowledge vedic knowledge he feels is the key for survival of hinduism and uh, i am sure he is going to present his his ideas about the status of hinduism at this particular time and what would be some of the ways we can counter this onslaught so with that introduction i request sri nandanaanand ji to take over and present his ideas of the, on this topic uh, today and uh, i really appreciate so the floor is yours so, sri nandanaanand ji thank you very much dr prakash rao i very much like uh, being in your association again and 
everybody else who's uh, tuned in. Let me just start uh, by one uh, mantra for wisdom and insight. Om Ajnanatir Mandasya Gyananjana Salakaya Chakshu Unmilitam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. And uh, let me just start uh, by giving some background information for myself, because many people wonder, okay, as a Westerner, how did I ever become so convinced of Vedic culture? You know, because I'll tell you something. Uh, many times I have Indian friends, Hindus that I meet, and oftentimes they say that they didn't start learning about their culture until they came to America and started learning from it from Westerners. So, and uh, so anyway, they regard me as one of those people that uh, they've learned from and they're thankful for. So, but how did I get here? How did I get to this point? Well, first of all, I can say that, uh, well, I may have started when I was about seven years old, because I remember when I was a kid and I was uh, uh, laying in bed on the weekends, my parents would be sleeping in, and I'd be laying in bed. I'd be thinking like, how did I get here? How did I get into this body? How did I get into this town or this family, you know? And uh, why didn't I get into my neighbor's body, Jack or Kurt or somebody else, you know? But then if I did that, I'd have different parents. So maybe that wouldn't be such a good idea. But how did all this happen? And why is the body so fragile? You know, if you can't breathe for three minutes, you die, or then you have to feed it and you have to give it rest and you have to take it to the bathroom and all this other stuff. What is this? It just felt so unnatural to me. So I had these questions when I was seven years old. Of course, that shows one of two things. Either I was one really weird kid or all this was a carryover from my previous existence of wondering about all this stuff. So the point of it is, of course, naturally, as you grow up, you got different things on your mind, different things take up your time and your interests and stuff like that. And so later on, when I was a teenager, I was uh, a musician. So I would hang out with the kind of like avant-garde people. And uh, we would talk about things like that, you know, okay, we're, we're having a good time, we're making music and stuff, but where do we fit into this world? So at one point I decided, you know, I got to put my guitar down. I got to find out some answers. I got to find out what I'm doing here, where I'm going, where I should be going. And how do I get those answers? So I looked at everything. You might say I conducted my own uh, comparative religion class, you might say, or studies. And of course, I was born and raised a Christian. So I thought, well, let me start out with the Bible first. And I read the Bible from cover to cover. And it took me a year to do that because it's not the easiest book to read. And uh, but as I went through it, I could see that, you know, it's got history to it. It's got moralistic principles. And let's face it, without moralistic principles, this world would be completely crazy. But uh, as I proceeded, I still did not get the answers to my questions. So I looked into everything. I looked into Egyptology, Judaism, Buddhism, uh, I Ching, Tarot, Magic, Witchcraft, you name it. I wanted to find out answers, and I wanted to find out where I could get these answers. Finally, there was a friend of mine that went, because uh, I was living in a small town in uh, Michigan at the time, and I had a friend that went to Toronto, and he met the Hare Krishna devotees on the street. He got a pamphlet which had, which had the books that they presented. They didn't have so many books back then, but we were looking at this pamphlet, and my friend says, yeah, this book here, this book, uh, this is kind of like the Indian Bible, you know, and it was the Bhagavad Gita. I says, okay, well, that's what I want, because I wanted to know what different cultures say about God, about the, the purpose of life, about the soul, about all these different things. So finally, I got the Bhagavad Gita, and it was a little blue Bhagavad Gita, you know, not the big one that they came out with later, but, uh, and, but when I read it, I realized this is what I'm looking for. This is, has the answers, what I'm looking for. Who and what is God? What is karma? What is reincarnation? What is the soul? What is the size or characteristic of the soul? Uh, and what is the field of activities, which is, you know, the material world? What are we doing in this material world? And it's more or less showed where we're going or where we should be going, which is more important. And uh, I realized at that point in time, I found what I'm looking for, but man, I'm a, I'm a long way away from being spiritually realized, so I better do something about it. So anyway, I read the Bhagavad Gita, and I got more of their books. 
uh, like the Krishna book, which was the uh, summary of the 10th canto of the Bhagavad Purana. But then I also read uh, the Upanishads, the Manu Samhita, and went on to the study of the Puranas. And I became convinced after all this study of all these different religions and cultures, this is the culture that has the most profound, insightful, and deep spiritual knowledge for which I'm looking for. So gradually after studying this, you know, because I'm not someone who joins any groups or anything like this, unless it's a musical group or something, but, you know, uh, so it took me a while to join the Hare Krishna movement, but I joined the Hare Krishna movement in 1975, and then I became initiated by Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami in 1976. And I, you know, was so convinced by this knowledge that as I imbibed it, I wanted to share it with other people. And so that's when I started writing in 1986. I started writing my own books, primarily for Westerners, uh, because Westerners, you know, if, if you use too many big words or too much Sanskrit, you know, if they don't understand it, they'll put the book down. And if they put the book down, you don't know when they're going to pick it back up again. Sometimes they, they cling to it, they stick with it, and they carry on with it, but sometimes they don't. So, uh, so finally, uh, after all that, I started. I came out with a book called Proof of Vedic Culture's Global Existence. And uh, I didn't think too many people would be interested in that book. Uh, and that's basically the biggest mistake I ever made in my writing career, because uh, I should have made it more academically, used more footnotes, stuff like that. But it really created a lot of interest. And that's why I can say that a little controversy in a book can add to the sales of a book, you know. So that was one of my best-selling books. It's the fact it's still being sold uh, throughout Amazon. All my books are on Amazon, both in paperback and Kindle. So that got me started, and that opened a lot of doors, which also included my first lecture tour in India, which was back in uh, the year 2000. And uh, I went with a friend of mine, Subhash Kak. You all know Professor Subhash Kak. And uh, so we went on like a two-week tour across uh, central India, and uh, he would give a scientific presentation, and I would give a presentation more just from the heart and explain what Vedic culture has done for me and why I'm so convinced about it. So if people didn't like the scientific uh, avenue, they would uh, identify with my uh, presentation. And uh, I remember the... Uh, <laughs> I remember when I was in uh, Vijayanagar, and uh, no, it wasn't Vijayanagar, Vijayawada. Vijayawada, I gave a very strong uh, lecture about the need to become proud Hindus and to be willing to uphold and defend your culture. And it was interesting because you can always tell how profound your and how touching your talk was by how many people come up and talk to you later on after the uh, lectures is over. And this one person said to me, he said, you know something, when you were speaking, I felt like you were the return of Vivekananda. And I thought, wow, okay, something's happening now. And uh, so I always went that way. But it wasn't until I did a tour in the Northeast India. Uh, over the winter of 2001, 2002, and then again in the following year, that I really began to understand the threats that Hinduism as a culture is enduring because of people who either basically want to exterminate it, or they want to take all the Hindus and convert them into their religion. Because when the Northeast, um, I heard many stories and I saw different things as well. Uh, you know, you hear the stories of how they try to convince children of the superiority of Christianity uh, by, say, taking them on a bus to the school. And for some reason, the bus doesn't start. You know, they're getting ready to start up again. The bus doesn't start. And they say, OK, let's all pray to Ganesh that the bus will start. And uh, meanwhile, the driver starts turning the engine and it doesn't start. And then he says, okay, let's all pray to Jesus that the bus will start. And so then he flicks a switch, which allows the electricity uh, the, uh, to go to the engine. And then it starts up again. And they say, oh, glory to Jesus, because this is, you know, the superior religion and helps get the bus started. You know, simple things like that. 
But then I also heard where it, I was uh, giving a talk in uh, uh, Manipur, and uh, there, and in Arunachal Pradesh, there, some of the Christians, what they would do is they would approach the house, the family house, when the parents weren't there, and then they would baptize the children, unbeknownst to the parents. And then when you baptize them, you give them a Christian name like Paul or uh, Ethel or something like that, you know, and it would cause division in the family that now the kids are Christian and you have to give up your religion so you continue with your family and all this stuff. So I was giving a talk in front of 200 people, and I says, you know something? I've heard about this, but when that happens, why don't you just take some water, a cup of water or something, offer it to your Ishta Devata, you know, whether it's Vishnu, Ganesh, Krishna, or, or Surya Bhagavan, Chandra Bhagavan, uh, and uh, take that water and then sprinkle it on your kids and now say, now I de-baptize you, and now you're back into the Hindu fold or what, you know, whatever the indigenous culture was. And people started clapping. They didn't, you know, they'd never thought of such a simple thing like that to counteract this, uh, you know, uh, deceitful form of baptism by the Christians at the same time. Now, let me say, if somebody is naturally attracted to Christianity and they want to uh, convert to it, I have no problem with that. But when you use deceitful means to convince people uh, outside the purity of the religion, if you can use that, then, okay, now you're going up the wrong street. You got, I got a problem with that, and I don't like it at all. You know, use the purity of your culture to convince people. Don't use trickery like that, because uh, it simply divides people. Like in uh, Arunachal Pradesh, for example, when the Christians came in and started converting people, you know, in harvest time, the whole village works together. When the village becomes divided by religions, what happens is now all of a sudden the village doesn't want to work together. The Christians, oh, I'm not working with them because they're not Christian, or I'm not uh, working with them because uh, uh, of this factor, that factor. So it divides the cooperation of the village to do the harvest because of these uh, differences that have come up. And uh, another thing, too, is they, they you know, because when we were giving lectures in the Northeast, we were telling people that, you know, uh, many people in the West are looking to the Eastern traditions for more fulfillment on their spiritual path. And they never even heard of that before, you know, because they're, most of them are simple village people. And they, they've never heard of what's going on in the West because they're taught that if you want a future, you have to develop Christianity and accept Western values. The problem with that is, is that as you accept Christianity and Western values of simple village where people were, you know, living a pious, moralistic lifestyle uh, would become divided. And it introduced things like sex outside of marriage. It produced alcoholism. It produced uh, rape, uh, unwanted pregnancies, things like that that were never part of the village before. So this was a, a great uh, deterrent to the uni unity and the happiness of the village. And uh, where there would never be any alcohol uh, shops or anything like that, there, there became a wine shop on every block. And I, could, I personally saw that. Where most people, if they wanted something, they would have what's called rice beer where you put rice in, a, in a, a bamboo stalk and you let it ferment and, you know, and that takes some time. It doesn't like happen overnight. That takes some time. And so you, you drink the rice beer and sometimes it's nothing more than a kind of like a zingy uh, fruit juice or something like that. Uh, but then when the alcohol shops came in, everybody started drinking all this alcohol, wine and stuff, and it just destroyed uh, parts of society. Uh, even when I was there in uh, Dimapur, for example, in Nagaland, they were having a New Year's Eve party at the hotel I was at. It was all young people, all young people dressing very provocatively and things like that. And they told me that, you know, gee, even several years earlier, this would never have happened. And this is all because of adopting the Western values uh, that are coming in 
through the means of Christianity. And so, like I say, if you, if you are attracted to Christianity based on its uh, moralistic principles and something that's nice, but you can also see where it divides a society, it creates havoc and disunity amongst the people in uh, some of the villages where, you know, it begins to crop up. So this is where I uh, uh, began to realize the threats, whether it's from a religion or even a political party, for that matter, uh, uh, that, are, uh, uh, that Hinduism has to face in order to simply survive and continue in its own uh, basic traditions. So saving the traditions is definitely a part of increasing the means by which we preserve the freedom of Hindu Dharma in the future and the freedom to practice its traditions. Later, of course, like Dr. Prakash Rao was saying, that I was invited to the Tirupati rally in 2007, where uh, you know I walked for a day with Kamal Kumar Swami, who did the Padayatra, and uh, I love that person because he, he, it, he did a Padayatra for six months, gathering people uh, against the government of Andhra Pradesh, and uh, where they were able to, uh, with the uh, associates of Dr. Prakash Rao, uh, the associates were able to deal with the politicians and get as many as 28,000 Hindu temples back under the management of Hindus. Because what the government does is they, they uh, seed the board of directors of each temple with their own people which are oftentimes not even Hindus. And so then they start selling the assets of the temples for whatever purpose they want. They don't give it back to the Hindu community. They don't give it back to maintaining or uplifting the conditions of the temple or anything. They spend the money on whatever they want. So uh, out of 30,000 Hindu temples at the time, they gave back 28,000. Of course, we have to know how to manage it properly, how to manage the temples properly. So there was going to be another... Uh, uh, Padiatra with Kamal Kumar Swami the following year uh, to continue to demand that we get our temples back under proper Hindu management so we can take care of them the way they're supposed to. So that was another eye-opening event which created uh, a great awareness of the challenges that Hinduism and Hindu Dharma, Vedic Dharma, is encountering because of these people that basically want to either take advantage of it for themselves, or they would rather just see the complete demise of uh, Vedic culture altogether, which shows the importance of what we have to do to continue this. Now, it's not like we want revenge for what, we've, what they've done or anything like that, but we want to uphold Vedic Dharma. But sometimes, let's face it, when we defend ourselves, uh, the, the media, the secular media, and then of course in India, secular means anti-Hindu. The secular media just calls it communalism or the attempt to saffronize, uh, the, you know, the, the land uh, to make it all under Hinduism. Well, the point of it is, India is basically a Vedic culture, and we want to continue to see a dynamic and thriving Vedic culture in India. So these are things we have to do, like Gar Waspi is one of them, inviting people back to the family. We want to invite everybody back to the family because let's face it, everyone is looking for light and love, and we want to provide that to as everyone, regardless of their social status or position. Just like bathing at the Kuma Mela. Has anybody gone to the Kuma Mela and bathed there in the Ganga? You'll know that we all bathe together with no knowledge whatsoever of who the person is next to us. We don't have many clothes on. We're bathing in the water. We don't know if they're rich or if they're poor, but we all work together and we all have the same objective of uh, gaining spiritual merit and continuing with the traditions of Vedic culture. So what is the difficulty? We can all work together. We can all uh, help each other uh, move forward in our spiritual progress and also in protecting uh, the future of Vedic tradition. For example, there's a story, and this was a true story, actually, but uh, when I was in Delhi one time, I heard this story of uh, a, a wealthy girl 
an Indian girl who wanted to save her money to find the best yoga teacher she could find in California. But she doesn't understand that many people in California are saving their money so they can go to India to find the best yoga teacher they can find. So this is the whole point. It's like, why do we, uh, well, this is the whole point of why Indians should understand the profound nature of their own culture. I mean, they may not have the means by which to study all the different religions and cultures like I did early on when I was a teenager and after that, to understand the profound nature and the depth of what Vedic culture has to offer. But the point of it is, we need to make sure that we understand what Vedic uh, culture has to offer. Because uh, instead of going to California, she could have looked for the best yoga teacher in her own backyard. But she has to be aware of what the Vedic tradition and what India has to offer. That's why I always say everybody should read Bhagavad Gita. If you can't read Bhagavad Gita, basically I have a book here, which I put together, a small book. It's only like 120 pages called The Power of Bhagavad Gita. And it has a summary of Bhagavad Gita. It has some of the things that Bhagavad Gita covers. Uh, it also has a chapter using the 108 most powerful, what I think, most important verses of Bhagavad Gita to explain how a person can, can progress towards liberation. When I was in uh, uh, Guwahati, I came across a Christian uh, book called uh, 31 Days Till Salvation on the Christian Path. And I'm looking at it. It's a short book. And I'm thinking like, you know, we, I could do something like this. So I put together a book called uh, 31 Days to Liberation on the Vedic Path. <laughs> and it's one of the chapters in this book uh, using the 108 most important verses of the Bhagavad Gita to, to uh, uh, imbibe the qualities that you need so that after 31 days, if you imbibe them and you keep them, basically you become qualified for liberation from this material world. So anyway, that's uh, some of the things I found and some of the challenges that we have to face. So uh, this is an example of the need to show the glory of what Indian culture has to offer. Now, it's already uh, 35 minutes into the presentation, so I'm going to start wrapping this up over the next 10 minutes. So how do we, uh, how, what do we do? Of course, as a uh, I always come up with action plans. Uh, that's one of my things in, in, in any book I write or the articles, I always come up with an action plan. And this is one of the action plans. Uh, this is from uh, a chapter in my book, Defending Vedic Dharma. And this is from a chapter in the unity of a united Hindu community. And what do we do? How do we work together? So first of all, we all need to be Vedic ambassadors. Now, what's a Vedic ambassador? Well, Vedic ambassador means you have to know the culture. And you, you don't preach, you don't shove something down somebody's throat or anything like that, but you simply share what you know, what Vedic culture has done for you and how it has helped you in your life. Because everybody likes a good story and everybody likes to know how you've overcome difficulties or problems like that. And this is one of the things we can do. We can all be Vedic ambassadors to represent the culture, not only for the youth, but sometimes in answering questions of our fellow uh, co-workers at our job or something like that. But we have to know how to uh, answer questions in a reasonable and non-emotional uh, non way. And in that way, represent Vedic culture to whomever we come across. Now, uh, we must, that means we must be educated in the profound nature of our culture, at least understand and be able to uh, repeat what Bhagavad Gita has to say. I mean, I come across Indians all the time. I ask them, do you know Bhagavad Gita? Oh, sure, I know Bhagavad Gita. Well, what do you know about it? Well, blah, 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 blah. they can't really explain, especially things in a way that is reasonably understood. I, was, I remember when I was in Siliguri, we came across, I was with members of the RSS, and uh, they had a press conference there, and uh, the press was asking questions to these elders who were simply getting emotional 
about how these questions were asked and what to say and stuff like that. So finally, they asked me, and I simply started answering the questions in a logical uh, way, uh, non-emotionally. And as I was talking about what we're doing and why we're doing it and what the importance of pre presenting and defending Vedic culture is all about, I could see them starting to nod their head. And finally, said they said, yes, this is the kind of answers we want. This is what we want to know. So you have to present yourself and the Vedic culture in a way that can be easily understood by others. This is one of the things. So the other thing we need to do is we need to be practicing the Vedic tradition. It is a right and a freedom which must be protected. As I, I wrote one book, uh, which has uh, become rather popular among certain people, Cause called Crimes Against India and the Need to Protect Its Ancient Vedic Tradition. And the history, it shows the history of India over the past thousand years. And it's, it's a heavy, kind of a heavy book because it presents different aspects of the history of India that many people are no longer taught or no longer aware of. Uh, but the point of it is, it shows how many people died over the course of the last thousand years simply so that we can still have the right and the privilege to continue practicing this tradition. If we don't value that, if we don't continue to defend Vedic culture, we can indeed lose that freedom. And we have to make sure that does not happen. Because I, I personally, I cannot imagine the world without the Vedic tradition. Uh, you know, it's the thing of it is, it's like, why would anybody convert from Vedic culture or Hinduism to some other religion, which is more shallow, more fundamental like that? Because the Vedic tradition has profound answers to all the questions that there is. Let's face it. In Christianity, if you ask too many questions, you're called a doubting Thomas. But in Vedic culture, it's all based on questions and answers. Practically speaking, any question you have can be found in one of the Upanishads, one of the Samhitas, or maybe the Mahabharata, the Ramayan, the Puranas. It's all based on questions and answers, and any question is, you know, legitimate. So this is the difference, and this is how we learn what spiritual knowledge is all about from the Vedic tradition. But we have to defend that. The other point is apathy is an enemy. You have to understand that. Being apathetic, thinking, oh, someone else will do it, doesn't matter. Uh, I'm okay. You're okay. You know, apathy is an enemy to preserving and protecting Vedic culture. My principle is I work to preserve, protect, promote for the perpetuation of Vedic culture. And a lot of people say, well, I'm not so much interested in promotion and all this stuff. But, you know, the old saying is that in, in the field of writing, once you're an author, always a promoter. Why is that? Because most of us writers, we don't want to deal with promoting. We don't want to deal with the business end of it. We just want to write our books. But the point of it is you might have the best book available. But if nobody knows about it, nobody's going to buy it. What are you going to do? The same thing is in this day and age. Everybody is promoting everything they've got. And if we don't add some kind of promotion or awareness of the profound nature of what Vedic culture has to offer, who's going to know about it? Who's going to learn about it? You know, it's that, like that wealthy girl in Delhi thinking she's got to go to California to find a good yoga teacher. She wasn't aware of the profound nature of what India's culture has to offer. We got to make sure that kind of thing doesn't happen. And the only thing to do about that is to make sure more and more people, especially the younger people, are aware of what the Vedic tradition has to offer in the profound nature of its uh, own culture. So the next point is everyone can and must do something. And maybe a little, and maybe a lot. Everybody has different prof uh, proficiencies. And so you may be able to do a lot or maybe not so much. Point of it is if everybody does something, then something grand can take place, but everyone must do something. Another thing to understand is when reading the Bhagavad Gita, it is not simply a philosophical book. It is a call to action. This is the point. 
Arjuna just wanted to go, he, he wanted to leave the battlefield. He didn't want to fight with his relatives or even friends or anything like that. He wanted to leave the battlefield and, you know, basically go off in the forest and meditate or something like that. And Krishna told him, no, no, you're, you have a duty. Of course, of, he was a kshatriya, so he had to have, had to have a, a military duty in, in this regard. But he says, you have a duty, and this duty is to protect dharma. Krishna wasn't advocating violence for any particular reason except protecting dharma. Because as things de deteriorate, things will get more and more evil, more and more wicked. Because I'll tell you something else. In this regard, I've been all over India. The only places I haven't been to is Meghalaya, Tripura, and Mizoram. I've been to every state of India, sometimes several times over. And the thing of it is, some people say, oh, the religion of India is the problem of India. <laughs> yeah, right, sure. Any fool can say that. The point of it is, I've seen that it's not the religion, but it's the forgetfulness of the religion. It is the misapplication of the principles of Vedic culture. It is the distancing from society, from its original culture. And you forget the principles of Dharma. You forget these things, or you misapply it, or you, you, know, you, you work according to the so-called caste system, which is a perversion of the legitimate Barnashram system, and uh, which was uh, detailed according to the Guru Kula system in the old days of India, where they would advise a child according to the proclivities, the intelligence, the tendencies of which way to go as far as their career goes. Not that they, not because your father is a doctor, you become a doctor, or because your father was a uh, craftsman, you become a craftsman. No, it wasn't like that at all. But it was this kind of misapplication which creates so much trouble uh, and the forgetfulness of what Vedic culture really has to offer. So this is what needs to be done. And we need to understand, like I just said, Bhagavad Gita is a call to action. We all need to stand up and do our duty to preserve, protect our freedom and rights to continue engaging in this uh, culture. The other thing is no sincere Hindu should be left behind. If there is any sincere Hindu, regardless of their social status, we should all work to lift them up, lift them up and become a part of Vedic culture. Uh, on in some manner, shape, or form. So uh, we must become united and work in concerted efforts and become a formidable force for Vedic Dharma. And formidable force means when the politicians are campaigning, who are they campaigning to? They're not usually campaigning to Hindus. They're campaigning to the minority religions, meaning Islam, uh, Christianity, uh, religions like that, because they're the ones that vote as a block. They get together, they decide the politician they want to vote for, and they vote for them. The Hindus, they hardly vote at all. No, we got to change that. We have to become a formidable force with whom the politicians realize that they have to listen to what we have to say uh, if they expect to uh, get in office or anything like that. So anyway, I just have a few paragraphs I want to read be, uh, before I close out, because it's already about 45 minutes into the session. But anyway, so those principles, how do we do this? First of all, we must become united under common principles, such as teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, united for stopping cow slaughter, united to stop the deceitful conversion practices that try to take people away from Vedic culture, and united for such things as saving the sacred Jamuna and Ganga rivers from all the pollution that is killing them. We should also be united to stop the corruption in Indian politics and united to keep India the homeland of a dynamic and thriving Vedic tradition, united for preserving all aspects of the Vedic spiritual knowledge and for passing it on to the next generations. We should be united for the protection and promotion of the glorious character of Vedic culture that everyone can appreciate. Who among us cannot join and be united for these objectives? And the more people who participate and work together, the easier it is to do for all of us. The more we work in such a concerted efforts, the more we establish a unified, global Vedic community. It is said that the War of Kurukshetra, the war to uphold Dharma, lasted for 18 days, 
which changed the world. If all Hindus, Dharmists, gurus, sadhus, bhaktas, etc., etc., all over the world ever really and truly united and work together as a single force, we could change the world in 18 days. I am convinced of that. Isn't that a goal worth working for? And isn't that a goal uh, worth fighting for? That, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Dharma, is one of the primary purposes of my life, besides my own spiritual growth, which also depends on the Vedic tradition, and all the great rishis of India who were strong enough, focused enough to put all this in writing. So this is all I'm living for, quite honestly. This is my life. This is my vision, but we all have to share the vision, and I will work with anyone who shares that vision. In this way, we can stand united, and in this way, we can stay united. So if you help me and I help you, if you wish me well, and I give you my best wishes, and we all work together like that, it creates an atmosphere of strength and positivity. It makes our future very bright and full of potential. And if everyone does a little something to help, fantastic things can happen. Many people will become attracted and want to be a part of it. Like they say, everybody wants to be on a winning team, but if they see the positivity and potential that comes from a united Hindu community, who's not going to want to become a part of that? So let us all work together, encouraging each other and become more united as Hindus, followers of, followers of Sanatana Dharma, and show the world the great contributions that the culture of Vedic Dharma has given and continues to give to all of humanity. Because don't forget, it's not just the philosophy, it's not just yoga, but it's all those thing, things like Jyotish, uh, Vastu, uh, you know, uh, martial arts, uh, diet, Ayurveda, so many things that help us reach our highest potential. It is not just a matter of, we, of course, Sri Upanishad itself says we need to cultivate nations with science. So material uh, uh, ability, and spiritual ability and growth are, are side by side. We work to that for those things together. So, and so this is right out of Shastra. So the point of it is, if we take care of Dharma, Dharma will take care of us. But we have to take the first step. That's the point. Together as United, United Hindus, we can do this. This is the potency and power if we stay together, stand together, and work together as United global Vedic community. Thank you very much. Dharma Rakshati Rakshita, Jai Shri Krishna and Jai Hin. So I hope that wasn't too controversial. No, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, you did a wonderful job, you know, being a, an American uh, white Christian at one time and uh, what made you to it, it will enable many of uh, Hindus to see the light in our scriptures. As you alluded, as you mentioned, many of us have no clue what is in store for us and how rich our culture is in terms of Vedic and other knowledge. So we are really deprived of our knowledge. We are like paupers in the midst of uh, the richness of our culture. I am glad that you pointed out some of these things, encouraging all of us to protect, preserve, and promote Vedic culture, which would hopefully resolve some of the issues and then attack all these uh, atrocities that are committed by other religions. So thank you so much. Sri Nandanananji, I'm so happy to see you again. And uh, I hope we will continue to associate and then work together. You have been saying uh, unity, unity and uh, work together. So I think let us do it. And so we will request you to help us in different ways. The time comes, we will approach you. Thank you so much. 
We really appreciate. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we applaud you for a, for your presentation. Thank you.